Good evening, everyone. Um, wherever you may be watching from, so good to have you with us. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings their host by number, who calls them all by name, by, his, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us pray. O God, our Father, you are a great God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. All glory and majesty, might and power, honor and wisdom and praise belong to you alone. You are the great creator of all things and the mighty redeemer of your people, and you will never grow faint or weary in bringing us to glory. And as we gather around your holy, inerrant, all-sufficient word tonight, please renew and increase our strength our strength for prayer, our strength for battle, our strength for service, that we may serve you faithfully and earnestly and gladly. For the sake of your glorious gospel, and for your own glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our sermon this evening, we're going to be turning to the book of 1 Thessalonians as we continue our series through it. I just want to give Another welcome. My name's Tom. I'm one of the pastors here with Vic at Hope Reform Baptist Church. If I haven't met you yet, uh, since this uh, whole uh, situation occurred in the world, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you when we get to gather again, hopefully in, in the next few months as the uh, government starts to release uh, the restrictions a bit. Really looking forward to getting to meet you uh, and preaching the word to you. It's my honor and my privilege to be uh, the one to do that. Uh, and to everybody, to my whole church family, I miss you, love you, praying for you, and I hope that you are opening up to First Thessalonians in your book, uh, in your Bible as we continue our series. We started a couple of weeks ago uh, on this series, and we are uh, in, up to uh, verse 5, end of verse 5 in chapter 1. We saw that this is, a, this is a church that has been planted by Paul, Silas, and Timothy all the way back in Acts chapter 17 in Thessalonica, that they had traveled all through Asia, but God didn't let them minister there. They went over to this new ground for the gospel to reach, Macedonia, and uh, below them, Achaia, which, which is the land that we now know as Greece. And they went there, they preached the gospel with much persecution, attack, physical beatings, imprisonments, being kicked out and banned out of cities. And, they, uh, and Paul ended up having to leave his Thessalonian brothers behind. A, a maximum of six months he had spent with them. And yet a church had formed. God blessed the preaching of the word. A church had formulated. He uh, would have um, established elders and left. And as he's uh, uh, on his way uh, back around, he, he, he lands in Corinth, and it's there that he receives word back from Timothy, who he had sent. He receives word back from Timothy to describe the state of the church in Thessalonica, and then he writes this book, and he is this, this letter in his day, and he is exuberant, he is joyful, he is happy to hear the progress of the Thessalonians, that they were not snuffed out, they were not crushed, they were not persecuted out of existence, but they've been thriving. Last week we looked at what the gospel preaching, what, what the gospel looks like in, in its power as it meets people, what it does to them. And tonight we are, we're reading what, how Paul uh, recounts the, the reception of the gospel among the Thessalonians. And 
and, and how the gospel has gone to them, spread beyond them, and the word about them has just filled the, the area. And so we're going to be asking the question tonight, how does God use an ordinary, young, underestimated church with, with so much going against it? The Thessalonians had so much stacked up against them that they were not yet, I mean, at the point that Paul's writing, probably about six months old in existence. None of them were Christians before that. that that's, not a, that's not a positive. That, that's not necessarily the church that I would want to be a part of naturally. And yet they become a church that anyone would want to be a part of. They were being afflicted, persecuted. You'll remember that the Jews in the city, they had... Uh, risen up in riots. They had set the city into, a, into a, a, a marching riot in order to get rid of these Christians, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and, and they did. But they couldn't get rid of the Christians who had uh, been resident in Thessalon- Thessalonica. And so they, uh, they could not crush them out. This is what the Thessalonians have going for them. They have elders or pastors who have not been saved themselves more than six months They've got a lot going on, but uh, as well as all this difference in demographic and, and culture of all the people that are there, races as well, religious backgrounds. But Paul writes to them, and he's not excited by, by all the sorts of marks of church health that we might hear about that we should be excited by today. He doesn't write and commend them and get excited about their financial situation. It, it may have been abysmal. It may have been great. We have no clue. We're not told. It's not really relevant. He doesn't write to them and commend them on the numbers, that they're enormous, uh, that that they've got multiple levels in their church filled with people. No, we're not told that. Could be, could not be. Ultimately, the health of a church is irrelevant of its size. He doesn't write to them and uh, tell them how, how amazing the programs are that they're running in their community. No, no not yet. The, uh, what he's writing to commend them on, the first mark of a health of a church is its engagement with and in the Great Commission. We need to mark this down. We need to make note of this, that the mark of health, the sign of health in a local church is that they are doing their part in engaging the world with the great commission mandate that Jesus left us with. That we would go into all the world making disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all, all that Jesus has commanded us to live and do, including the going and the spreading of the gospel. So we're going to look tonight at at, at really answering this question. How does God use this ordinary church like Thessalonica to become a church that is a great commission, obeying, gospel-spreading church? How how does God do that? Well, first of all, we're going to look at, uh, I'll read through from verse 5 through to the end of verse 10, because that'll be our text for tonight. Our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you have become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And may God bless this word as it goes out among us, as we would open our hearts to receive it, this inerrant, infallible, God-breathed scripture. Well, I want to look tonight at first how, how a church becomes active and effective in the Great Commission by firstly imitating its leaders, imitating 
and then becoming examples for other people themselves. And then lastly, how the, 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 their, their conver- uh, how their uh, conversion, how their converted lives become a witness to other people. So we'll start with looking at how we become imitators, how the church of Thessalonica, and you'll see this in the end of verse 5, that Paul says, you know what kind of uh, uh, men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Well, the very first step in new Christians, young Christians, maybe young in age, maybe young in spiritual age, the very first step in becoming mature, in becoming those used by God in the Great Commission is to look at the life of those faithful, mature, Great Commission engaged Christians and imitate their life. Even before you start being able to fully understand, thoroughly know the the ins and outs of Scripture, you will be able to see the ins and outs of mature Christians and begin to imitate them. Now, of course, the the clarification is not that you just copy everything you see those other Christians doing as if any person is going to be a perfect example of Christ, but Paul says that you became imitators of us and the Lord. And so we need to make sure that those we're following, well, we are doing that in conjunction with reading the Word, hearing sermons, praying and, and growing in ourselves that we might be able to copy in our mature brothers and sisters what is exemplary of Jesus Christ. So they would look to, and they saw how Paul and Silas and Timothy had lived when they were among them for that short period back in Acts chapter 17. And how Paul, Timothy, Silas had exemplified Christian ethics and Christian lifestyle. And so they sought to copy the lives of these men who had been their examples. This is... This is just basic. This is, uh, this is uh, Christian biology, if you would. This is so basic to how Christianity develops, spreads, and the church grows. Just like it is so simple to humanity in any anthropological study, you know how does the human race continue? How does it propagate? How does it spread? Very simple. Men and women have babies and raise them up in their likeness. And then those same humans, then as adults, go and make babies and raise them up in their likeness. That was the command to Adam and Eve, go fill the earth, multiply. Well, that is the same principle at play in the Great Commission. That that is the ordinary way that Christianity spreads. In a spiritual sense, Christians... I, I, I give birth to, or, or this is the imagery that they would bring into life through their preaching the gospel, bring into life new spiritual babes or Christians, and would then walk with them in life to raise them up to be mature Christians, which doesn't take 18 years. According to our account of the Thessalonians, it could take up to six months. And so that is how it happens, that mature Christians beget or, or, or bring into existence by the grace of God, the work of the Spirit and the word of the gospel, that we bring into existence new Christians, that we emulate and, 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 and disciple them into Christ likeness, and that they then go and do the same. So, so let me ask you, just, just, just six months into their life, this is happening. Have you... Have you yet, Christian, to get, are you yet to get to that point where, where we might be able to point another Christian to you and say, go, go imitate them. Go, go follow, spend some time in their life. They're mature Christians. You, you copy them, you'll, you'll become a mature Christian. Are you at that point? And, and if not, I, I hope you've not been saved more than six months. Otherwise, we find this out of balance reality that what the Thessalonians grew to become in less than six months, you and I are taking years and years to develop if we get there at all. This is a call to maturity. This is a call to rapid maturity as the Holy Spirit can do. Because the the normal progression of the gospel in the Great Commission in this 
church relies on there being mature Christians who can develop young Christians into Christ likeness. So I would just want to talk to the young Christians for a moment. Those young adults or maybe very recent converts, I want to I want to encourage you to be doing your part just as the Thessalonians did. They were not passive. They were actively seeking how they might copy mature Christians. So I would encourage you to number one, fellowship and seek people who are outside the, the level of your own maturity. So, so seek somebody who's been walking with Jesus a while, who's, who's leading his family well, who, who seems to know his word and will not be perfect, but you'll be able to gr- gain a lot from that. And I know we often uh, uh, gravitate towards those who are like us, who know the same amount of biblical theology as us so that we don't need to get embarrassed by sounding dumb or, or we, we, re, we, we gravitate towards those of the same race as us or the same age as us in order to not uh, get out of our comfort zone too much. But I'm, I'm encouraging you to be like the Thessalonians who saw examples, sought those examples and then copied those examples. And it doesn't need to be a complex uh, progress or uh, process or program, just start asking questions. Ask your questions to those mature Christians and their answers will come with years of experience, knowledge from the scripture, and you will develop in this way. This is the normal process. And and notice that that in all of this, what it is, is the, now look, I want you to see in verse 5, that that you are, saw our life, and then into verse 6 he says, you became imitators of us and the Lord, that's the important part, for, and this is what imitating Christian leaders looks like, for you received the word. That's the, that's the essence of it. You're not just copying other Christians. You're receiving the word of God and how it should be obeyed by fellowshipping with mature Christians. That's the point. That is the sum and substance of your maturity and your growth in the Christian life is how much of the Word of God are you getting into your soul and obeying. So that is important, that you would receive the Word of God. But it comes, and it came for the Thessalonians, amidst much affliction. For you received the Word, verse 6, in much affliction. And we saw this just before, that as soon as they were in existence and starting to act and teach and believe and and live like Christians, they had the Jewish populace coming down on them heavily with jealousy, with hatred, with murder in their eyes. We don't know whether some of the Thessalonians have in fact died, have been killed by the Jews. We know uh, that that they have been suffering, he says over in chapter 2, verse 14, at the hands of the Jews. And he says, you know, and they also killed the Lord Jesus. So, So maybe there had been death at this point. But what we know is that affliction, and you can think back to the parable of the sower that Jesus told, the parable of the seeds that, say, that fall on the four different soils, Jesus uses that parable to show that affliction is a real test for true Christian faith. That many people say, I believe Jesus, I've, I've had this great conversion experience, I'm going to chase after and live in Christianity, but when suffering comes, When difficulty comes, it's the great test of that faith. Is it real? Is it genuine? Is it as pure as it claims? It's like, you can can, uh, look into this, that that as they test silver, if somebody comes to you with a chunk of silver, wants to make some kind of payment with it, I don't know, imagine we're back in the day when they would do that. One way to test whether this is true pure silver is to take scrapings of it and filings and and drop onto it some nitric acid. And and depending what color that acid turns as it strikes the silver will show us whether or not that is pure silver or in fact fake. That they will drop it on it and, and if it is true pure silver, that nitric acid turns into a creamy white and they know, well, this is this is real the real deal. And so affliction is for us, that it it comes into our life and and many people at that point, those who have false conversion stories or false faiths, a shallow faith, it is easily ripped up, 
put to the side. God's not convenient anymore. This isn't comfortable. This is costing me too much. I don't believe it. I'll walk away. Well, the Thessalonians had received the word in this affliction. They didn't just grow a while, then receive some. They were born in the middle of this storm. And they, in that situation, had yet received it. Look as verse, uh, the verse continues. Received it, the word of God, amidst much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this is truly how they're imitating Paul and Silas and Timothy. Paul, Silas, and Timothy did not get bitter at God, angry at the Thessalonians, disgusted with their circumstances once they were uh, beaten and, and, and thrown in jail or driven out. In fact, we can see just the city before Thessalonica, when they were in Philippi, they had been beaten, their back was dripping with blood, they were in jail, and they were singing praises to God singing hymns together so that other prisoners could hear them. That, that's the joy of, of Paul and, and the example set. And that's what the Thessalonians followed him. We're, we're being attacked for Jesus. We're getting rewarded for this in heaven. Praise God, who are we? And they rejoiced in that. That is truly, truly the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's so many uh, claims of in, among Christian so-called circles today that will say that the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life is that your business flourishes, your family goes well, your health is smooth, your finances grow. And, and this is what we're told, but what we see in the, 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 I mean, we just open our Bible and the prosperity theology blows away goes up in flames and down in ashes because the Bible shows us the example that the true work of the Holy Spirit, I mean, anybody can get excited by riches. Anybody can, can serve God as long as he gives blessing like that. But the true work of the Holy Spirit that is not able to be faked by carnal, sinful hearts is when humans like you and me, sinners though we are, Rejoice in the gospel amidst much affliction. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. That, that, that I think, is, is the summary of the book of Acts. Receiving the word of God among much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I think that's a, that's a, a, a summary of all of church history. I think that's a valid summary of our church's history receiving the word of God, walking in it with much affliction, but the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so may it continue. May we be those who do not, who do not turn back from the word, who do not fail to continue to imitate our examples, who are not stagnant on the Great Commission, but who are receiving the example given to us, rejoicing despite affliction in the Holy Spirit. That's step one to being a church that is actively used by God in fulfilling the Great Commission. But number two comes in. Because we said before that, that, that uh, imitation and giving other Christians examples is such a core part to discipleship and to the Great Commission continuing that we see it now bump into second gear. It jumps now to a second generation. So uh, in verse 7, Paul says, so then you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Do you see what's happening? That, that they were imitating Paul so well that they were now examples to other Christians and, and no small section of land. These guys were, when he says all of Macedonia and all of Achaia, this is a, a land mass about the size of Victoria, the state down in South Australia. We we, we need to understand that a whole state, a whole area, an enormous province are all looking to this one city's Christians and saying there is an example for us to follow. The Philippians, they're looking to the Thessalonians for encouragement and examples. The, the, the Christians in, in Corinth and the Christians in Athens, they're all in Achaia. They're looking back to the example of the Thessalonians 
for how they should be living. Uh, I don't know if, if you've experienced this, but, but I've, I've, got a, I've got a young boy. He's about uh, 18 months now, and, and he was just recently over at his cousin's house. Now, his cousin is only about uh, six or something. I'll get in trouble for that. Five, six? Less than 10, let's go with that. And, and, and he's, a, he's a young kid himself, but, and I, I know his parents are, are always still needing to treat him like a child and educate him on how to speak and how to take care of others and how to be polite and helpful, and that's just what we do for kids. But it was recently that, that my, my little boy, 18 months, was over at his house, and in walks the parents and finds their child parenting my child by, by, by cutting up food for him, by, by helping him, instructing him, teaching him manners. I mean, I mean, that is, I mean, it's cute, but it's also a good picture for us. And how much joy that, that gives the parents that, that you can look at children that you're always having to parent and see in them a parenting culture, a, a, a teaching dynamic. So, so that you don't just look at that kid as, as a kid anymore. He's now also a co-worker in the task of parenting in, in a sense. And so Paul is looking at the Thessalonians. And they could, now you can imagine the other, the other option. He looks up to Thessalonica. He looks down at Corinth. He looks over at Athens. He looks up at Philippi. And he just says, look, there's, there's hundreds of Christians because of our labor. <clears throat> and that's great. But that's hundreds of Christians that need maturing that's hundreds of kids that need uh, discipling, if you will. Well, now, now Paul can look at the whole church of the Thessalonians, and rather than just seeing a bunch of more immature kids, he's able to look at them as those who are, in a sense, parenting the other Christians all around their area into maturity. This is a joy for the apostle. He is excited by this. He is encouraged by this. But this is an example simply for every single one of us. This would be the kind of Christianity we're seeking to live that others can follow us. So, so maybe we, we take excuses for this. Well, I'd love to be an example for many others. I'd love to be the kind of guy, the kind of gal who can, who can encourage others and bring them on the road of Christ. But I've been saved less than a year. You know, I'm a teenager. I'm, I'm just very young. I'm new to this Christianity thing. My friends, remember, Thessalonians saved less than six months. Already examples for an entire state of Victoria-sized area. You, whoever you are, wherever you are, as, as Paul will even instruct Timothy, don't let your youth, your young age, or maybe spiritually, your, your recent conversion, don't let that be an excuse as to why you will not seek to be so full-heartedly after Christ that you might encourage, stir up, and be an example for others. Rather, use that youth, use that age, that energy you have, tempered by wisdom and plenty of advice and lots of Bible. Use that as a way that you might bring others in, give and inject this youthful energy of the Spirit into others that they were, and here's, here's what that looked like. They were an example that was both preaching a word and, and showing by their witness. So they, were, they, they had this, this preached word, but also a permeating witness that would go about the culture. Let me explain that. First, Paul says, now read back verse 7, sorry, verse 8. He says that you have, in verse 7, he said, you have become examples to this whole area. For, verse 8 says, not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So what he means is that, that we have this, number one, the word of the Lord is sounding forth from you. That means the gospel, the word of the Lord, the truth of Jesus, dying for sinners, being truly God, truly man, offering himself up as a sin-carrying, wrath-bearing, atoning sacrifice for anyone that believes, having him risen from the dead, assuring eternal life for anyone that believes, and him sitting in heaven until the day he comes back. That word of Jesus, of the Lord, has been sounding forth from you. Now, the other times this word is used 
in the Bible, in the Greek, this sounding forth is actually a word that, that denotes a, a loud trumpet blast or, or a, a loud shaking thunder. So, so that they were not just suggesting, they were not just uh, hoping people might listen to what they had to say. They were in boldness echoing the sound out. They were, they were preaching in as they did, as Paul did earlier, they were preaching in power with full conviction of the Holy Spirit. It was a couple of years ago, uh, well, a few now before I was married, uh, and, and I had gone with my friends and uh, family on a, well, my, 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 relative, my extended family, onto my Bucks party weekend. And we went camping out in this bush that was hours after you had any service left on your phone. And went into this valley, and then uh, from the, the little uh, check-in office, we took another couple of kilometers out into the valley even further so that we could just do what we wanted to do and make whatever noises we wanted to make out in the bush and uh, not distract anybody, uh, as you would on a Bucks party, being very uh, uh, considerate young men. We were out there, and amongst everything else that sort of went on that weekend for a bit of fun, we, somebody had the, 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 the great idea that as we're sitting around the fire, and, he's, and he's, he smells a bit. So he goes and grabs his, his uh, spray-on deodorant. And I'm sure you know where this is going. Sort of gives himself a, a spray. And now he's, all, he's smelling great. That's, that's, a, that's a young adult shower. That's what you need to know. He took a shower with a spray can. And uh, there wasn't a great deal left. So he just lobbed it into the fire. Which would have been okay had we been standing back away, had we been a fair way off, but we were all just sitting around this fire, not, not more than a meter from it, and it's blazing. It took a few moments for it to click for a couple of us what had just happened, and before words can come out of our mouth to warn anyone, we're just, we're sprawling, we're, we're running backwards, trying to get back and yelling for everyone else to do the same. No one, uh, some of them didn't really know what was happening, but when a couple of guys scream away from a fire, it's usually an idea to do that as well. So we all run, and on our way, not even far away, uh, the, 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 the deodorant can combusts and just explodes explodes through this valley. And the sound, the sound of that bang in this quiet night was not a pop. It was not a fizzle. It was not a crack. In fact, it sounded as if it rung multiple times because of the echoing off of the mountains. It went right through the valley. You could hear it echoing down the chasm. It was the next morning that the, uh, those people kilometers away came and wondered what in the world had happened. Well, this is what that sound of the gospel, in a people gripped by it, in a people on fire for Jesus, this is what it sounds like. And little, don't do that. Don't throw your deodorant. I'm going to get sued. Don't go and throw deodorant in the fire. It's not smart. We were, we're, there were holes in tents and it was a dangerous night. But, but the point is, right, that the word of God resounding out of a people who love it, going to the streets with evangelism, going to, in our day, the internet with gospel preaching, doing all that we can to preach this glorious gospel out of here. It resounds through the world and through our locale like an exploding deodorant can through an empty valley at night. It is heard ringing back and forth and it is inescapable. That's the kind of explosive preaching that they were embodying. But, but we have also, and that's an example for us, but we have also the fact that in verse 8, he says, now the word of the Lord sounded forth from you. That's your preaching. But also, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. This is talking about their, their, their radical conversion, their turnaround in life, their, their changed lifestyle, how they were all now living as Christians. That reputation, that strange news of pagans becoming Christians was starting to get through the gossip mill, Start, started getting into the media, started really being discussed by everybody else. And here's what I want to say, that the gospel is preached powerfully through the Holy Spirit by Christians. But if you live in a way that has such a radical turnaround uh, conversion, that witness is carried on not by Christians, but by non-Christians, 
Right? Christians will never hear the gospel from you and then do all that they can to go and spread it to others. What, what they will do is, is talk about your changed life. They'll start talking, did you hear about her? How she's like, you know, she used to be, she used to be one of those girls. And I mean, you've seen her now. She's a church girl. I mean, you know, you've seen what he was doing, how, how he used to live, but man, now he's just on fire for Jesus. He's going overseas on mission trips. What's with that guy? He's crazy. And so non-Christians carry that, that rumor, that, that gossiping about your changed life, your faith all throughout the world. And so it was happening in Thessalonica in not more than six months. This word was getting around and Paul says, it's gone everywhere. Now he's sitting in Corinth, but he has just uh, reunited with a Christian who has just come over from Rome, further west than Macedonia. Now, it's likely that maybe as he's talking with them, they're sharing with him the story about the Thessalonians. That, that, that the, the, the witness has, of how Thessalonica has been turned on its head by this Christianity, the news of it has spread even over to the capital of the empire. And Paul says, this is just astounding, Paul says in verse 9, um, uh, in the end of verse 8, that this reputation is spread so that we need not say anything. Uh, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. In other words, Paul's, Paul's meeting up with Christians or, or with people and he starts to tell them the story about him being in Thessalonica, preaching the gospel, being shoved out, but they're doing well. And as he tries to tell others, they'll, they'll stop him. Yeah, Paul, we, we know that. We've heard the story. How, how are you so far behind? Everybody knows about the glory of the gospel in Thessalonica. I, I mean, over in Rome, they're, they're talking about what God has done through the gospel in Thessalonica. I mean, we all know this. It, it's beating Paul, the gospel, the, the, sorry, the story of the reputation of them beat Paul to Corinth. This is astounding. And this is what happens with a true turned around life. And I want to show you as we close here that verse 9 shows us and verse 10 shows us what that conversion really looks like. So we've seen that Christians, that the gospel spreads by us becoming imitators of those who preach, those who, who are our mature examples. And then we also become examples through our preaching and our reputation of repented lives. But what does that that lifestyle that becomes so gossiped about, what does that entail? And Paul tells us, he says very specifically, what everyone's talking about. He says, and everyone is talking about how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and you wait for his son from heaven. Very simple. In fact, commentators think that this was probably a, like a, 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 statement or, or a, a saying or a, um, an old saying that they would have in Christianity, that this was sort of a formula that they would give for conversion. And, and it's radical. He says that they turn from idols. <coughs> Thessalonica is, is hundreds of years old. Mount Olympus, where apparently the Greek gods lived, is visible from their city. They're steeped in idolatry. It's part of their lifestyle. They worship that way. It's a part of their economy. It's a part of what they do in, in their romance relationships. It, it's a part of everything. And there's a lot of fear in these pagan cultures. There's a lot of fear um, involved in breaking from your old religion in order to change. The, that the witch doctors will start coming after you. That, that the gods will start cursing you. That your people, your friends, your family will, will cast you out. Some of you listening to this sermon know exactly what that is like, whether it's from a Hindu background, a, a, a New Age background, whether it's from an Islamic background, or, or a background from a particular country in the world that is opposed to Christianity. But this is, the, this is my favorite part in missionary biographies. This is, my, this is the most encouraging thing to see, that, that despite the, the grip that idolatry and paganism can have on people's hearts, souls, minds, and life, Jesus is more powerful. Jesus is more powerful and imparts to people a faith that turns from idols, shames that religion, embarrasses those adherents to the old religion. I, I love reading and, and, and finding in, the, in Madagascar in the 1800s how David Jones went in and people were turning from children to adults, to the king, 
from the, the idolatrous worship of these little idols that they had in their homes. Even in recent years, the last 20 years, how, how the Kor- Kor- Korowai people over in Papua have turned from their spirit- spiritism and, and witch doctor ways to believe in Christ, preach and teach. How in the Solomon Islands, even just a generation or two ago, there are and still are today those who are bound by spiritism and animism, the worship of, of inanimate objects and, and, the, and the demonic idols behind them. And yet we have, and I love to say that we have in our midst people descendant from those very idolatrous people, those who have turned from those idols, believed in Christ and whose descendants are among us in this congregation. Those who, uh, in, in Myanmar, just 60 years ago, about there were, there were minority groups uh, and one particular that was given to animism, had, had no written language and, and the, the, just within the last 60 years, missionaries go in, they are, are, are changed by the gospel, turned from idols and are now sending missionaries into the capital of Myanmar. This is what God does, turns people from their idols. And of course, it's not just paganism. Paul even talks in the New Testament that that there is a way to live with your God as your belly. He says that consumerism and, and jealousy and coveting things is a form of idolatry. He says the same thing about sexual immorality. That these things can grip somebody's life, enslave them to a lifestyle, so that is what you are all about, chasing after those things. And to leave them is impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit coming to you through the gospel. But that is a part of what was becoming the reputation of the Thessalonians. And that is what God has been doing through history, has done among us, and will do as we go with the gospel. People turn from idols to serve the living and true God. We'll make a note here that serving God Being dead to sin means also being alive to God. That if we would claim we've we've turned from idols, we've turned from sexual immorality, we've turned from those things, but there is not also the active life of service to God, then the claim of repentance is false. Christians who have truly been born again leave behind their sin and become active in their service to God. The true and living God. And here's that motivation. How how is it that those who serve fake gods, those who serve demons, those who are in cults that serve a fake dead God, how can they be more zealous than us in evangelism? How can they be outdoing us in the work of the mission to get to these fields, to get to these unreached people groups? How is that possible? It is is possible because we we let ourselves get, get, get lukewarm We do not stir ourselves up in the direction and in the energy of the Great Commission. And maybe we've also lost the hope that Paul says next. It is such an everyday part of Christian life that we need to remind ourselves of the hope that is coming in the future. That Jesus will return. He will take us with him. He will remake this whole earth, give us new bodies, and be with us for eternity in blessed glory. And it's that which motivates and enables a life of serving the true and living God. And it's that which which motivates the the turning from idols to come to Christ. But but I think in, in most practical terms, it's just not that much of a motivation for many of us. I think that that if I said that uh the great hope, the daily encouragement for Christians is that we have this coming future, I think that mostly we would say, I just don't need that. I'm not desperate for that, that reminder of the hope every day. I mean, I can get through a couple of days, weeks, months or years without really needing to sit down and, and remind myself of the glory that's coming. And I think, I think that the reason that we need such little encouragement is because we're doing such little work. I think that, that the pattern is that the less you sacrifice, the less we, we toil in this life, the, the, the less the, the next life becomes such an encouragement. The, the less we go without in order to advance the gospel, the less the, the promise of rest in heaven becomes a comfort to us because there's just not a whole lot of sacrifice, toil, 
sweat that we've needed comforting for. And so I think that that what we must do in order to be like a Thessalonian church, we must pursue these things. Those who imitate examples given to us by receiving the word among much affliction but with great joy. That we should preach an explosive, loud gospel. And then let our reputation of leaving behind dead works of sin, leaving behind idolatry, and serving God with all of our energy as we wait for his blessed son from heaven. We we have that as our permeating reputation throughout the world. And in doing that, as we we, and we intentionally walk into the planting of churches, the spreading of the gospel, God will bless us. Ordinary, weak, sinful, n- not all that glorious, nothing really to marvel at. This ordinary church, just like the Thessalonian church, will be used, utilized as we commit to those ordinary works in the Great Commission. That's the, the spread of the gospel in its New Testament pattern. And the encouragement here is this that this is all based on, because of, and all to the glory of Jesus. End of verse 10. This Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Christian, this is a life worth living. This is a commission worth engaging in. These are churches worth planting. This is a gospel worth sharing because your future deserved wrath. Before Christ, all of your future Your whole outlook of what is to come was destruction from God on you for eternity for your sin. The full justice that the law demand for every one of your broken sins was was piling up for you to take for eternity. And because of the work of Christ on the cross, taking the penalty of the law and the imputation of your sin, you now look to the future and see not condemnation and see not damnation and see not wrath on that day when Jesus comes back and destroys all his enemies, casts them into the hell of fire, that, that, that lake of fire. We do not have that to look forward to. We have a glorious Jesus with open arms to receive us into the blessing of heaven. That is what we look to. That is what Jesus has secured for us by dying. And my invitation is to anybody without that joyful rest, to anybody without that assurance of salvation that we Christians have, without that, to those without repentance, to those without a turning from idols, to those without the joy of the Holy Spirit, to you who have not received the gospel of the Lord, command you to leave your sins behind. Come to the one true living Jesus and be saved. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the example of the Thessalonians. We repent, God, of our own sin and our own lukewarmness in this great commission mandate. We pray, God, that you would not allow us to to become stagnant and and then start grumbling and wondering what what this purpose is for and what what God's going to do through us and, 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 and demanding that you work in us and on us and bless our ways when you have told us you will bless us as we serve you, the living God. God, I pray that our church continues to be and becomes ever more a preaching church that hits the streets, goes to our workplaces with a powerful gospel shared in love, and that we have a reputation for such works that show that we are serving the true and living God. God, may you save today many people who are on the track towards the wrath of God in the end of days, at the end of their life. Would you save them Bring them instead of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. Forgive them by them having faith in Jesus for all that he has done for them. Bring them into your family. Bring them into our church. Put them into this army that we would be active all the more in showing the world the glory of this gospel. We praise you, Lord, and thank you for all that you do. Amen. Well, that was so encouraging hearing again about the spread of the gospel and the church doing its part. 
And um, we look forward to this continuing next week in our evening service. So thank you for that uh, message, Tom. Our benediction tonight comes from the book of Romans, and I'm reading from chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we'll leave you with those words. We bless you. Both Tom and I miss you all very much and uh, hope that uh, we'll be able to catch up face to face soon. In the meanwhile, go and have a blessed week, each and every one of you.